Hello, good evening. Uh, you guys asked for the activity we did today, Rationals Bingos, to actually be um, explained and clarified for every question for those of us who were struggling with our rationals. So remember, first things first with, first with our rationals, you have to be able to factor. So if you are struggling with factoring, you need to go click on the playlist, you need to go to the algebra playlist, and you need to watch those factor videos. At this point, that is an expectation. At this point, you should know how. It shouldn't be, oh, I'm struggling to factor. It should be, okay, I can factor. Get to that, I can do it. All right, so let's go ahead and start our first one. Our first one asks for the domain exclusion. What is a domain exclusion? That's a domain restriction. That's where can this question, uh, where can this rational not exist in the domain? And so, you know, the first thing about domains is that we always assume on all reals. The only difference with this is that we have a rational expression. That means we have a fraction, which means that we have a denominator which could potentially equal zero. That's where our domain exclusion exists. All domain exclusions, we assume all reals. Then we set our denominator equal to zero. We solve for our variable. Most of the time it's going to be x, but whatever the independent variable is, and that, wherever that is, x cannot equal, that's your domain exclusion. And sometimes it's multiple. So looking at this question, I simply set my denominator equal to zero. If I divide by 12, zero divided by anything is simply zero. Now, anything divided by zero is when we hit an undefined moment. So that means right now on bottom, I've solved for X saying X equals zero. But if I plug zero in, that zero is the denominator. That means my domain exclusion is X cannot equal zero. My next equal. Okay, here's our second one. So remember the very first thing I told you to do is factor it out. So we begin with a factored form, which is n plus one uh, times n plus five all over n plus one. Now this is gonna help us for a few different things. I can find out my domain exclusion. I can also identify vertical, horizontal, etc. But we're gonna do them in order of the slide. So my domain exclusion, all I have to look at is the denominator. I didn't really have to do this portion for this question, but I'd have to do this for any other key feature. So we set this equal to zero. If I subtract from both sides, that means n currently equals negative one, but if I make that negative one, it zeroes it out. That means that's my exclusion. n cannot equal negative one. My domain would be all real numbers, except when n equals negative one. My next question is another domain restriction. Again, I could take the time to factor out the whole thing, but right now I only need to worry about factoring the bottom and my factors on bottom are going to be m plus two and m minus one and we set that equal to zero so that becomes m plus two equals zero m minus one equals zero and we move those over so that means this is m equals negative two and this is m equals positive one because i add one i add one i subtract two i subtract two that's where those come from so again these are my domain restrictions so i say this is where it cannot equal Now we'll move on to a vertical asymptote. So here factoring is gonna be extremely important. So on top I have P plus four. On bottom I have P plus four times P plus two. And so what we do when we look for this is we look for if we can cancel. If we can cancel, that's what we call a whole. Whatever we cannot cancel, whatever is left over, that is our vertical asymptote. So I look, I can cancel out this. So now there's my vertical asymptote. So I set my vertical, I set my factor equal to zero to find the root. And that tells me that P equals negative two. So this is where my vertical asymptote lies. Vertical asymptotes go straight up and down. That means this is my independent variable. That means this is correct. P does equal negative two. I would have an imaginary line there. My next question is again, domain restriction. So all I have to do is look at the denominator set that equal to zero. Uh, I could either factor this or bring that over. It doesn't matter which one. So 15a is equal to positive 15. And when I say it doesn't matter which one, I mean in this particular instance, in this example right here. So I continue and then 15 divided by one is always gonna be, anything divided by itself will always be one. And again, this is a restriction. So this tells me a simply cannot equal one. It exists everywhere else except at one. Our next question asks for a whole. So again, we have to factor this. This is gonna be x minus five times x plus two all over x minus one. So our whole, we look for what we can cancel. Guess what, we could cancel all of this. So that means I know, 
I'm going to set X plus two, what I just canceled out, equal to zero. I bring that over. So that tells me my X value is two. In order to find my Y value, I simply take this and plug in whatever wasn't canceled out. So all of this is now gone. So I plug it into this. So that becomes negative two minus five over negative two minus one. And that's going to be negative seven over negative three, which is a positive seven thirds. So I actually have a hole at negative two comma seven thirds. Positive, positive. Okay. Here we have another where we're identifying the hole. We already factored this one out earlier, so I get to just copy that over n plus 1, n plus 5, over n plus 1, and look what we get to cancel out. We get to cancel out those n plus 1s. That means I set n plus 1 equal to 0. I discover that my n value is equal to negative 1, so I take that and I plug it back in. So that means I have a hole at negative 1, comma, whatever this is. So negative 1 plus 5, that's the same as saying 5 minus 1, that is just 4. So you have a hole at that point. Okay, our horizontal asymptote. For this, I don't even have to factor. I don't have to do anything because all I'm using are my three little concepts. If I'm bigger in the top, then I know I equal zero. If I know my exponents are equal to each other, I use the coefficient. If I know that I'm bigger, sorry, I said this backwards, bigger on bottom is the first one. If I know I'm bigger in the top, then we call this an undefined point, which means that you have no horizontal asymptote. But when we have bigger on top, we have to check. If my numerator is exactly one more, then this is what we call an oblique asymptote. This is supposed to be m plus one. There we go. This is an oblique asymptote. So here, my horizontal asymptote, all I have to do is look at my biggest exponent on top. This is bigger on bottom. The two is greater than one. So that means I have a horizontal asymptote at y equals zero. It's as simple as that. Here we have another horizontal asymptote. I identify my biggest exponent on top, my biggest exponent on bottom. This means that it's bigger on bottom. That means it's undefined. That means there is no horizontal asymptote. However, I told you if you have bought you, you should check. This is two. This is a one. That means this is literally one more than the denominator, or the exponent in the denominator. That means you have an oblique asymptote. Okay. So here we have another find the whole. So I'm going to show my factors that I, we put on the screen last time. And again, all I want to do is find where I can cancel. I just canceled that. So what I canceled, if it's a whole, is what I set equal to zero. So that becomes P equals negative four. Ah negative four. So that's the beginning of my hole, right? Negative four is the beginning of my coordinate point. I take this negative four and I plug it back in, but I need to make sure what was left on top was actually the number one. So that's going to become one over negative four plus two. Negative four plus two is the same as saying one over or negative, negative one half. So I have another point at negative one half. Okay, we have a vertical asymptote, and I'm just going to keep going until I get as far as I can get in 10 minutes. So here we have n plus 1 times n plus 5 all over n plus 1. So it's asking for the vertical asymptote. So I cancel, but instead of dealing with the cancel, because that's only for a whole, all I want to look at is what's left over. Well, what's left over is only in the numerator. Does that mean there's a vertical asymptote? Well, there's nothing left down here. That means there is no vertical asymptote. Okay, here we have another hole. Now this question kind of stumped you guys in class because you didn't recognize that you can factor this out using the greatest common factor. So I have a common factor of two. I have a common factor of three. I also have X's everywhere. So this is actually gonna look like two X times X plus five over three X times X plus five. So ta-da, now you have a common factor. That is your whole. So X plus five equals zero. That means X equals negative five, which is the first part of my answer. I take this negative five and plug it back in. That becomes two times negative five over three times negative five. That's negative 10 over negative 15. Uh, that's gonna be a positive two thirds.
Okay, this one's asking us to identify the whole. So again, to have a whole, I have to factor this out and see if anything cancels. But just looking at this equation, there's only a nine on top. I can't cancel 